caps most important riders just like you are remember. And it's our association, so uh, it should be thanked for your service and passion for the world today. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce two clinicians who I and many others saw last year in the evening after the delivered two fantastic sessions. Uh, both these clinicians have followed somewhat of a similar career track, both on the field and in the approaching room. Uh, Jeff Pike played 15 years for West Ham United and then two years each for Moss County and later on. While at the Hammers, those who don't know who the Hammers are, it was West Ham United. Uh, he played in the FA Cup final in 1980 when they beat Arsenal, and that is the equivalent of the Super Bowl. Uh, after his playing career, he was a youth coach at Leighton Orient, which is a short distance from West Ham, and then went on to become a PFA regional coach for nine years, and for the last seven years has worked at the English FA. His current role is as a national coach educator. Uh, he is a holder of the Pro License and A License, and is a tutor on both of those courses. Uh, somewhat similar line, uh, Jamie Robinson played 13 years, including stints at Liverpool, Barnsley, Carlisle, and Torquay. Uh, once Jamie finished his uh, extensive playing career, he also moved into working for a professional club in the youth ranks and was uh, organising a football development role at Shrewsbury Town. Uh, like Jeff, he also became a uh, BFA regional coach and now works at English FA and his current role is National Coach Educator and Head of Youth Coach. So sort of Head of Youth Elite Coach. So please, show your appreciation. You're going to learn an extensive amount. I've been fortunate enough to go back to England, which was my home a long time ago, and uh, see some of the material that we present to you. So your heads will be swimming, uh, but you will be certainly feeling uh, enriched and rewarded. So please show your appreciation for our two outstanding clinicians. Thank you, guys. Uh, no pressure then. So we'll try and uh, fulfill what Jason's just uh, alluded to. Just going to start with uh, just a brief uh, video. Just to get us started, what I'd like you to do is just take one minute and write down three things, three words, individual words, that mean that to you. 
developing and empowering coaching environment. What does it actually mean to you as an individual working with players? Three words, just three words, not sentences, three words. We'll give you one minute. important to you. Start with that one at the top and work down around the three. When you've done that, underline it. Now share with the person next to you that word and the reason why it means that to you. Can I speak to each other? We don't bite. If you're not sitting next to anybody, then turn around and share with, with the person behind you. What does it actually mean for you as an individual, that one word? Anybody in the room prepared to share that with us or with the rest of us? Anybody prepared to share? Are you going to share it with us? Go on. Okay, if you didn't hear that at the back, the word that was come up is trust. And another word that came up was around um, ownership. So, anybody else prepared to share? Yes. Okay, so leadership there. Character. Can you explain a bit more about character for me? Consider these four words. Who, when, what, and how. So who do you coach? When do you coach them? What do you coach? And how do you coach? Is it very much around you as an individual to coach? Because that's the perception of the word coach. Or are you prepared to let the players do some of that themselves. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a small island in the English Channel called Guernsey. And I travelled to the island and I worked with some nine and ten year old players. And the coaches that were there observing the session, uh, 
was a little bit dubious about what I was trying to do for them. I got a whiteboard and some pens. I got the balls, I got the bibs, I got the markers. And I drew on the whiteboard the area, drew X's and O's to represent the players, explained the rules and wrote some instruction down on the whiteboard and propped it by the side of the goal. Then said to the players, now you go and set the practice up. The coaches could not believe that the players at that age were able to do it. Because the perception is, is that the coach knows everything and the player knows nothing. Try and flip the coin. Within five minutes of the session starting, the players themselves were teaching each other the rules of the game. So are you strong enough, are you able, are you capable enough to be able to let that go? And to be able to empower those players to actually take ownership of the session. So just out the, over this period of time that we're going to be uh, uh, with you here, we're going to try and reach these key objectives. Uh, to explain the FA's player and coach uh, vision, we want to try and help you understand how we create an environment that, and empower those players. Highlight the key elements of the FA youth courses and, uh, which develop players from five years of age <coughs> to 21. Vision for players, to produce technically excellent and innovative players with exceptional decision making skills. But what does that actually mean? Can you teach players to make decisions? Yes you can. But you need to be able to create the environment for them to have that opportunity. You need to be able to create a fear free environment. Players will make mistakes. Uh, if you observe Jamie and I's session yesterday, there wasn't a huge amount of success in the initial part of the session because it was like chaos. The ball was flying around all over the place, people were losing possession of the ball, but that's the environment that they are going to be brought up in and need to be <coughs> subjected to because that's what's going to happen when they go and play a game of football. We use an analogy uh, when we do our coach education programs. Um, one of our uh, ex-members uh, of staff who developed our FA Youth Award Module 2 uh, spoke to a gentleman that was going to row individually or single-handedly across the Atlantic. So he had a conversation with him. He said, how do you train? Uh, do you use a rowing machine? And he said, Yes, he said, I put one outside my back door. He said, but if I use, to, use that too often, I'll only learn how to row on a rowing machine. He said, to practice, I go in the Irish Sea. And if any of you know what the Irish Sea is like, then that's the environment that he needed to go in. So how can you as an individual create that environment for them so that the practice becomes real? You want players to be innovative. You want players to be creative. How many in this room, uh, as, uh, and put your hands up, feel free to do so, uh, a player has taken a player on and tried to dribble past them and lost possession? How many of you in the room have stopped the practice and said, no, don't do that, pass there because he's free? <laughs> How many of you are brave enough to allow that player to have another go? Because next time he might actually go past that player. So sometimes we coach that out of them. We need to consider how we can coach it into them, or not coach at all. There's a uh, gentleman, a lot of you may well know him, uh, and there's a, a fellow in the, in the audience, Alan Irving, who was talking about it the other day. Don Howe, uh, used to be at uh, Arsenal, uh, was uh, assistant manager for England for a while, and he was in the environment of uh, myself and a number of other coaches, and he asked us a question. He said, if a player receives the ball, face on, and controls it and loses possession because he's controlled it in front of them, what do you do as a coach? 
So to a man, everybody put our hands up and we said, we'd stop the practice and we'd coach that player to control the ball to one side or the other to maintain possession. He said, what if you didn't? What if you actually waited for another similar situation to arise and the player receives the ball and controls it to one side and maintains possession themselves? He said, is that not good coaching? Are you able to do that? Are you able to understand that that player might need to have a go at it, try it, or then try something else? And that's about empowering those players to go through that learning process for themselves. A vision for coaches to train, develop, qualify, and support more innovative coaches. What do we do on our coaching awards? We educate those, those coaches to achieve a level of competency to get the qualification and, and uh, uh, to become either A license, Pro license, B license, level two. They have to reach a level of, level of competency, so we have to have some assessment process. <laughs> to create innovative coaches, what we need is those coaches that are going through that process, is to come up with something that's a little bit different. Bearing in mind that there are some outcomes that you need to achieve from the session, how you get there sometimes is irrelevant. So are you able to do that? Are you able to be innovative and creative as a coach? Can you teach it? Do you understand teaching? Do you understand learning? Does anybody in this room not know what their own learning style is? Do you understand what your learning style is? How do you learn as an individual? Because if you can understand your own learning style, then you've got a chance of understanding your player's learning style. So, in the past, in the good old days, we would put on a coaching session that was a one-size-fits-all coaching session. And we would expect the players to come out of that. We would make a judgment or an assessment on those players on that one session. But if we'd have done it slightly differently, or educated that player in a different way, Potentially, we might not be making that judgment. We might be making a different judgment or assessment. <coughs> what do you think motivates Wayne Rooney? The environment he was brought up in. Anybody else got a different idea around that? Yes. Passion for the game. Yeah. When Jamie and I first started playing, our sole motivation was to play in the first team of the club that we was at. Irrelevant of any financial implications, anything else. That was all we ever wanted to do. When that happens, we reset targets and goal. So it's the next bit. What happens next? Nothing ever came into it apart from that. All we wanted to do was play the game. There isn't, unfortunately, that many who you could say that about. Because there's a lot of players in England at this present time and their motivation is extrinsic i.e. financial, which causes a problem.
motivates them? What motivates Frank Lampard to play one over a hundred times for his country? What motivates Stephen Gerrard to play for his country over a hundred times? I never unfortunately had the opportunity to play for my country. I'd have cut my right arm off to do that. And so I'm sure Jamie will be the same. So we've got to look at those intrinsic and extrinsic motivational skills. But when, we, when Jamie takes over in a second, he'll explain how that works within the environment that we're working in at this present time. Um, they started with intrinsic motivation. There might be slightly different motivational uh, things now for them because of where they are and what they do. I think the other. The other bit which is of interest is when you talk about the players that we you see in front of you about decision making and about what's involved within decision making. So when the players are playing and the players you're coming to a contact on a daily basis, you're getting put in circumstances like that, whether they're this big, five year old, or whether they're 25 or 35, they're going to be put in circumstances where they have to make the right choice, they're going to have to come up with the right decision based on what's in front of them. So we're going to go through some little uh, couple of models around decision making and how that might look. And you might argue that over time the, 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 the expert players in any sport are the ones that have been able to make the correct decisions on a more consistent basis, um, more effectively, quicker, um, more uh, adaptable under pressure than the people that don't don't achieve the, the, the highest level in any sport, whether it's football, tennis, golf, whatever it's going to be. So we're going to go through this little model around what Wayne Rooney might be thinking about. Can you see that? Yeah, can you see that? What Wayne, Wayne Rooney might be thinking about when he's going to have to make a choice, when he's going to have to make a decision. So he's going to be thinking, uh, sorry, he's going to be getting some, some visual input, he's going to be scanning the situation, he's going to have a look and see what's going on. There'll be a, there's a lot of information, so like Jeff said yesterday, uh, Sorry, just, just before yesterday, when we're doing the practice, and when you've seen any practice here, the game's chaotic. There's lots of things going on. It's multi-directional in many ways, even though we're attacking a goal, a goal and playing that way. There's lots of things going on. So you're having to think about, and you get lots of information. So lots of information is going into the brain, and the brain's got to make some choices about what it's going to do with that. By recognising the things that's, that's, that's being those sort of those inputs that are coming into the, into the brain about what's happening, so it's patterns of movement, it's recognising what's happening to your own body, it's recognising what's in front of you, what the opposition are doing, where your teammates are, what the flight of the ball is, what the weather conditions might be. There's lots of information that's coming into the brain to make a to make a choice and to recognise what's happening. I suppose Wayne Mooney and any of, any other footballer is then having to make a decision based on what's Entering what the inputs, what their perception of that, what their perception is of that input, because we'll all see different things and recognise that, that different things could happen. Tap into his football memory, his knowledge of the game, his, um, his tactical and technical, technical understanding of, of how he performs the game, and then recognise other other instances like Dick talked about yesterday about what's the state of the game, what's the score, we're playing home and away, um, what's our form like, what's what's happening in terms of in the game at this moment in time to make the choice which is the most effective. And ultimately you're going to make a choice of what's happening, it's happening like this over and over again about what's happening in the game. And then he's got to think about how he's going to achieve that outcome. So that even in this instance here we can see that it looks like the ball's, the ball's been covered from one way, he's now going to change and check the direction and move the ball and try and do something else. So his head's looking up, he knows the ball's that way. So again, he's able to achieve that technical skill if you want, being able to look at what's happening in front of him, but still be able to, to execute, control the ball, and shift it, and decide what he's going to do next. And whether he's got the, the kind of 
the movement skills to be able to do it. So we're going to relate this to, to a younger player, and he was maybe going to shift that ball out of his feet to hit a longer pass. What might be some of the dilemmas that a younger player might face in terms of his movement or his physicality to be able to do that? Yeah, so balance, or they, they might not have the, the physical capabilities to, to execute the kind of physical output that Wayne Rooney could, 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 could do. So he, he could hit from there the goal that he, where he played the ball over the top when Van Persie scored that great volley last year. He might be in that position there where he's looking to get out of his feet and, and play a 50 yard ball over the top or whatever, whatever it was. So you, you're relating that what, what in terms of the output he, he can achieve relative to his age and stage of his development, which is going to be different for all the people that you're working with. Just moving through a little bit before, we're going to, we're going to, we probably talked a little bit in the, in the session yesterday about when, when to intervene, when to go and coach. So you'll see players doing certain things and thinking, do I step in now or do I not? That's the ultimate dilemma of the coach, but when you go in and when you don't. When you're going to let the players try and work it out for themselves and when they might need some help. Alongside that, you're always thinking about, you know, the learner. Who, who's the person that's in front of you? Who is it that you're dealing with? Who is the, who is the person that's, that's, that's learning the game and understanding what, you, what, the, what, the, uh, what the activity is all about today and trying to make sense of that? Together with that, I'm thinking about where does it sit within, within our curriculum? You know, what, what's the demands and the role that you're trying to place that player in on that day? You know, is there a more of a um, physical demand to the session today? Is it, Physical and tactical, is it psychological? You know, being guys in the audience today who, who was part of this research, and it's a really interesting model in terms of how these three tools, three elements also interact. So, we're going to focus mainly on the how of coaching, understanding the learning environment, structuring activities and coaching behaviors, so you can try and link these three elements together. So, how we're going to go about doing our work is going to be driven by who's in front of us. Who the, who the players are in front of us and their needs and wants, and understanding what the curriculum is, what our program needs and wants, and how that looks, and how we're going to try and develop the players through their ages and stages. I suppose the youth award in, in, in England is very much developed around the needs of the player. So Jamie Robinson plays within a team, and I, I also play, um, I need to understand the role within my unit, so if I'm a centre half, I understand what, what we need to do with the back relates to the goalkeeper, what happens in the midfield, what happens with the forwards, and how those units interact. But I have to be, as a coach, I have to be very mindful that I have, Jamie Robinson has to be the best player that he can be. But I have to understand where I'm at, what I need, and to devise a programme around my needs. And we think we think the uh, we think the way that we can shape this is by clearly defining and clearly um, Shaping what that climate is, what that environment looks like. And the only person's behaviour who I'm going to try and get Jamie Robinson or Jeff Pike or Gareth Morgan, the best player that he could possibly be, is to try and think about what the environment looks like and think about how I interact with the players. And to interact with the players, we have to produce the best and the most thoughtful and the most engaging constraints led practices that we can think about to drive the players towards the sort of outcomes that we might want to to try and achieve, again, in the chaotic game and the clips you've seen there, with well backs able to let it go between his legs and flick it in, you know, where uh, Baines is able to escape that, 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 that tackle down the sides and skip past someone and deliver. You know, it's really, really difficult for, for coaches to recreate those circumstances. A player has got to be adaptable enough to see what's happening within the environment, which is the game, um, and see what, he's gonna, what, see what he's gonna be able to come up with as a result of what that environment looks like. And we've got to carefully think about how we can replicate the game in practices that look realistic, yeah, relevant, yeah, clearly related to what the players, players' needs are. And we have to have a think about the way that we're going to intervene and, and, and interact with the players and how that's going to look. So is it about stopping and telling and showing what we might want? Is it about asking them and, and posing them a problem? And it's always going to be a combination of that whole spectrum of ways that you're going to go about you know, using your teaching methodology to try and get the best from your players. Our youth awards try and build on what these environmental factors are and the impact on the four corners. And I'll go through them in a minute in terms of, I'll, I'll go through the four corners in a second in terms of technical and tactical, physical, psychological and social. But we, we, 
really have to have to consider what this environment looks like in, in real in real depth. We have to delve into the into the returns from the practice. So if we're going to do a practice from here back and forth with the ball, we've got to be aware of what that what the returns are from that practice and how different that is from a game. So if you want to if you want to do something like this, it's got returns, but it's got certain returns that the game will provide. Whereas the game provides lots of opportunities to do certain things, but it, it doesn't demand you to go up like this ten times out of ten. So there's returns from practice that you've got to have a have a, have a you know, clear understanding of I'm sure that the experience of the room you've got you've got a vast array of, of sessions that you've got. We always think about why you can put them on, what are the reasons, what are the returns that you get from those practices, what are the combination of practices you might you might put into your program to try and push the, the players to be the best they can possibly be. The third one is, is about the intervention strategies you might use and how you might challenge the players to think about what the solutions might be to the problems that you pose. The module three looks at how you how you how you intervene, how you pose questions, how you set challenges for the players, and how you try and constrain practices and constrain um, targets for them to let them come up with choices. Like you have said about the, the kids in Guernsey, if you if you let set them go, it could go anywhere. You have to be brave enough as a coach to try and think: Is it going towards the outcome that, that we all were all seeking, or is it going off on a bit of a tangent? There'll always be a return of the players of ownership of the session. You just have to be comfortable enough with where that's going to go. Well, the four corners, as I said in the, in the in the last slide, the youth awards look to try and consider the player develop the players sitting in the middle and being developed and influenced by factors that sit in any one of these four corners. So what are the technical and tactical demands of the game? What are the psychological demands that are being placed under the player? We have a, we have a sort of five C framework that we use within the FA in terms of looking at the, social, the psychological impact. What are the physical demands of the game and how does that look through the age phases? And then what's the social environment and the social interactions between the players that's wrapping itself around, around the activities that you do? And we want to think about how the, how the players become better learners. Someone said about leadership. We want players to be good leaders and be led. We want players to be good learners. We want players to recognise the, the, the importance of the team. We want players to develop independence about what they do. And if we sit on all the solutions, then we can't go from, we can't cut the umbilical cord with the between us and the players. But we have to give them the framework to be able to come up with those solutions and come up with those. They have to have the choice from us to set it down here. They have to have the ownership and choice to come up with solutions which are right for them in their circumstances. I suppose on the back of that, we did. <coughs> I run a program of coaches that go into football clubs to do work with the coaches. And we did some stuff about match day behaviour before a couple of weeks ago. Um, sorry, just just after Christmas. And one of the one of the, the kids were about twelve. We said about our match day. What is it that you hear from the side on a match day? Because we, we, we adapted some strategies to try and think about what the social environment would look on a, on a game day that would help the players. And, the, and one of the lads said, well, if someone's talking all the time, it's just a distraction. It's a distraction. Yeah, so we're, we're thinking we're giving, you know, fantastic information and shaping the way it's going. And the kids are saying, oh, I just, I can't, do you, do you understand what, what, what they're saying from the side? No, no, really, it's, it's just distracting me. So again, I suppose it, it, it tries to, to, to pull up, to to provide the full picture around what the environment looks like for us and what we think we're doing as coaches could be looked slightly different for the players. They could be perceived and what you're trying to do with the best intentions and look slightly differently. So it's a, it's a fascinating area to try and link in the social environment and we, we try and describe that as the interactions between the players, social interactions between the players and the coach, and, then, and we look at the psychological uh, factors being the intrapersonal stuff. So, what is it within the environment that tries to shape me, and what is it within me that tries to shape how, shape how my behaviour looks? What are the beliefs that run behind that behaviour? So, just a thirty seconds, just with the person next to you. What are some of the things that the environment needs to try and consider to go from? Can you see that? What the environment needs to consider to go from? Right. Okay. We all. I'm sure we'll all be. Um, be in agreement that the environment is absolutely, absolutely critical when getting people or players to produce their optimum performance. 
Um, there's, a, there's a list as long as you're on that we could write here on the right hand side from, yeah, we need players to perform to the optimal level at some point down the line. We want them to develop through the ages and stages. We want, we want well being for them, self esteem to be high in them. We want them to enjoy it. Clearly, we want them to, to be intrinsically driven and enjoy playing. Whatever standard they're going to play, whether they play from, they come in contact with you at five, I'm sure you'd want them to play right through through their lives to be healthy and enjoy playing, playing sport. So think about a couple of things like sitting here. Go on, give you just a 30 seconds to a minute, think about it, just discuss it with the person next to you. Off you go. a couple of things out there you've been thinking about. What sort of things would you need to think about when shaping your mind to try and get some outcomes down this side? Come on, just shout. What have you got? Brilliant. So give me a second. Give me some voice and choice. Yeah, come on. Come on, else. There's some great discussion there. There's no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer. The, the, the lesser players have to feel that they belong to the group. Okay, so belonging is key. Love that one. Good. So it's got to be challenging, good. Go on, what do you mean by that? Explain that a bit more. Okay, good stuff. Yeah. So the, the players will want to be they want to be challenged by either playing against players that might stretch you, yeah, by being supported at the times, by recognizing what the what the practice is trying to do. Challenge is a is a is a great word and something I think kids absolutely need require with what they're what they're trying to get. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Good. Come on, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's, uh, it's sometimes, again, so the only person's behavior you can control is yourself. And again, those as parents and adults, sometimes we're, we're more, um, we want them to do as well as they possibly can. And when they fail, I think sometimes we want to fix it there and then. Whereas if it's a long term player development program, we know that we're going to have time to do it again somewhere down the line. Go on, anything else? Their ideas, even if they're not the best players in the group. Okay. Are you times they are not the best ones, they have the right concept, people don't respect them, so yeah, let's do it as a place. Okay, good. So I think that's a terrific point. Again, having a, having a chance to have some voice but being respected within the group. Because again, we, we've all played with different sorts of players. The goalkeeper does something very different from the centre forward in terms of their, their role in providing the top performance. So if someone has an idea, we have to respect that as a, as a teammate and try and think about how we can do that. It doesn't happen overnight. Have a little think about how the environment then looks in terms of what the climate might look like. So what's the social context? And you've mentioned lots of things I'm going to go through in a minute in terms of the, the sense of choice, belonging, how we judge their confidence. But it's really about what we say, how we organise, communicate, and try and impact on the players. And why, why when we praise the players and provide uh, you know, feedback around, around performance or mistakes. And if we think about these ABCs in here, <coughs> I suppose we try and, through the University of Birmingham, we, we developed a, we were involved in a European study around, uh, I think it was five European countries, if memory serves, around um, autonomy, belonging, and confidence, and how we think about these, these three elements to increase intrinsic drive, intrinsic motivation in the place, to at some point down the line get these outcomes. With the A being autonomy, so the players are going to have some voice and choice about what they're doing, some <coughs> some lot of what, what they do and how they how they feel about their activities is going to be absolutely key. Now it's not handing you know the asylum over to the lunatics; it's making sure within that 
within how you shape that, it's absolutely clear about, well, this is where we're going to agree things together, this is what we've all decided, this is, what we're, this is how we're going to go forward. And that doesn't say within that, as a coach, you can't say, no, we're not doing that. Yeah? But that's got to come up within, within some terms that you're absolutely clear about. You can't have a choice one minute and then take it back the next. You've got to think carefully about how you're going to use that to empower them, to give them ownership. Think about how they, you mentioned it down here, think about how they feel part of the group. You know, these are driven around self-determination theory, how you know, basic human needs decide we need to feel part of something bigger, part of a group. Football by nature is an individual as part of a collective, an individual player playing within a team. And then this confidence element around, well actually, how do we think about the way and how do we judge and how do we give them feedback around what they do? So if they do the best they can possibly, possibly be around the kind of uh, Harold Dweck, growth mindset sort of elements, the task and ego, can, can, can they be the best they can possibly be? Can they work as hard as they possibly can? Yeah. Can they recover from mistakes? Can we, re can we not rank them against each other and say, you know, because you play, I play better than you today. You know, how, how, do you, how do you make sure that you don't, you don't try and get that into team rivalry as your only way that you motivate the players? You've got to try and think about how you judge confidence and try to be the best they possibly can. I'll show you a little bit of footage from the under 21. <coughs> Consider in terms of the decision making process, what's going on, what the inputs have got to consider, what the choices that could be available. So we're on the outside down and up. Where's the keeper? Can we go round and do a chip in? So Sterling is the place of football from the 21. Danny Rose, Tottenham. going on, lots of choices to make, <coughs> probably lots of things going through his, through his head in terms of what would happen. Um, I suppose we're not privy to lots of background stuff though, are we? So what state of the game might that be at? What is their psychological state? What is their physical state? You know, are they, are they on the back of giving two or three passes away? You know, have they just tried something that's, that's, not, that's not come off for them? How do they manage that risk? Um, there's lots of things which will go on beyond which would have been going on previous to that, to judge how effective it was. If you go back to the, the, the Youth Awards, um, we're trying to think clearly about trying to develop the, those three areas. So developing practice, uh, developing the environment, and developing the, the way the coach and players interact. Yeah, so they'll be the cornerstone of the way the, the youth modules trying to hang the hat on what, what they might be all about. So what's the environment look like? What's the practice then? How cleverly is that designed? What is it look what is it looking to trying to do? And then what are the coaching player interactions? And the advanced youth award tries to I suppose analyze that from a more of a four corners perspective and try and refine that practice. So we want to introduce some of these concepts, which are you know constraint based, try and develop them through the youth award and then move people through that, that pathway and try and think how that affects young players going through the age phases. Because the, the aim of our Advanced Youth Award course is to try and think about how you develop sort of um, age-specific coaches that are work between the three age phases. Um, our, our youth rules over the last couple of years have, div have divided the, the youth development uh, journey from sort of 5 to 11 and in, in the foundation phase 12 to 16 and then on to 17 to 21. And again, 
mentioned at the start about how do we coach this individual within the collective. We can't always produce teams. So under nine, we don't need the best team at West Ham. We don't need to be the best team. We just need to produce the best individuals that we possibly can. And somewhere down the line at West Ham United to come together as a team. And at some point within that journey, you're going to have to trade off some bits and decide what we're going to do. The clubs are also thinking about how this relationship looks, looks in terms of their, their own philosophy. So how the sort of players that they might want to produce and how that might look. So Jeff talked at the start about the FA's vision for, for players and for coaches. Whereas the ECPP, the, the, the youth rules that came into effect two or three years ago now, have, have asked clubs to clearly define what they want from their programme, what's their philosophy, how they're going to coach, how to look through the age phases, and the, and the coaching players have to, have to come together and, and define what that's like and how that looks and try and shape how that looks moving, moving forward through the phases. I suppose the award tries to, tries to help and support those coaches as going through that difficult journey, that difficult challenge of dealing with the development of a new player. So in the middle of that plan and in the middle of that development programme sits the, sits the vision, the academy vision. What's the, what's the coach and player philosophy? They have to define an academy <coughs> performance plan. Think about what the four core returns might be through their program. Think how might that look in terms of some short, medium, long-term planning goals for the individuals, for the teams, for the phases, for the coaches, for the coach developers, and then review that system on a six-weekly or 12-weekly basis, depending on what phase you're working in. And then think about as you go to the from the big picture stuff in terms of the season, three-year plan, 12, six-weekly plan to our, you know, our microcycle weeks, thinking where that might look like and breaking it down to the detail around that individual plan. And then obviously reviewing that on an ongoing basis. So we try and support the clubs around, around where they're at, where their coaches are at through the phases, uh, where the players are at and trying to get the players to be the best they possibly can be. So we're trying to highlight, again, around this decision-making process and where that sits and how the use of autonomy, sense of belonging, and how you judge confidence can develop you know, intrinsic drive in, in the player and try and allow the, the players to make these most important decisions um, fear-free so they can achieve uh, the best uh, performance they possibly can. Thanks for your time. If you've got any questions? Just, just, to, just to finish off on that, there were some things I just made a little note of while Jamie was talking. Um, Every time you coach, you create an environment for learning. Just consider that initially. Is it enough to create or set up a session? Or do you need to consider other things? When you talk about challenging players, is, it, is the challenge the same for every player? Do you have the skill as a coach to be able to set different challenges for different players in the same session? Just consider those three, those three or four things. Okay. Has, uh, has anybody got any questions? Yes. I would imagine so. Yes. Not on uh, from this convention. Yes, but I don't know. It won't be, it certainly won't be online from the FA. No, not at this present time. But you're there. They're recording everything that's on the convention. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we've we've got uh, uh, we've got a visual for that. Give me a minute to find the slide, but if you're talking about from the, the command style, I suppose it's going from autocratic through to democratic in terms of how you might go about your work, how you might 
pose questions and think about how you're going to interact with the players, go for a more command style approach. This is this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Don't have a go. So, you know, here's the problem. Uh, this is what's happening. Go and try and solve it. You know, so you, you you're left with that that spectrum about autocratic to democratic, player led to coach led. Uh, sorry, coach led to player led, and and all those those bits in between. You know, in, in terms of where you might be with the players. Um, what the interesting thing we've had in our country, I suppose, I mean, in this country is about well, how much should the coach be, and how much should the player be, and how much should the player decide what we're going to do, and where's that balance? You know, again, I heard people talking this week about well, you know, people are paying for me to coach their, their kids. You know, they might be getting in there and doing stuff, but they might need to improve them. You know, it, it's a tricky, really tricky balance and dilemma. Again, around trade-offs, if you're going to take all the decisions. The players, then when they come to play, then not really put the umbilical cord. If you're letting them do everything, and you're, and you're the, the players are, are, are solely leading everything, then where's the interaction? Where's the, what's the, the social interaction with the coach? What's the social construction look like from the environment that you create from, from the you know, from the adult? You're trying to get it's a tricky balance. The the, the one thing about it, Jace, is that. Uh, when you set up a coaching session, whichever intervention you met method you use, it should be the appropriate intervention method for the appropriate player at the appropriate time. Uh, and that may be, you might have to go in and actually take that person's place and show them. You might have to ask them a question. You might guide them into something. So it's very much around that particular thing. And that's a real skill of what the, uh, the, of the coaches uh, and what they need to consider when they're going in and actually intervening in the session. It might be that you intervene when the ball's actually moving, so that the player can relate to the ball when it's moving. Anything else? Yes. The idea is to ensure that the kind of The, the, the biggest challenge we had, Gareth, is that we have different strands or streams of qualifications. And it's the interaction between all the qualifications. So we have what we call a mainstream qualification, which would be our level one, level two, UA for B, UA for A, UA for Pro license. And then we have this other strand, which is the, the so called youth strand, which is the mod one, mod two, mod three, advanced youth. Um, the biggest challenge for us is to get people to understand that. Um, it's just about being a coach. It doesn't matter where you are or where you sit along that spectrum. It's about being a coach. So when we talk about intervention methods, which is the perception of the youth awards is everything is around question and answer, whereas the perception around our mainstream uh, qualifications is about being more autocratic rather than democratic then the, that's the challenge that we have to get people to understand that they are integrated. It's just about being, choosing the right method at the right, right time for the right, right situation. That, that's, a, that's a major challenge for us at the moment. And we're going through a program of development around the actual coaching pathway and how we can show a visual that actually works for everybody at the same time. I think, I think you're looking at the back of that as well, the challenge for coaches and where we're wrestling with it is also about coach educators, coaching other coach educators. So obviously we've got, we've got the players here, then we've got the coaches here, then we've got the coach educator series trying to influence this coach education group around what this, uh, you know, again Jeff said, it's just, it is just coaching and uh, you know, we, we don't want it to be a, a polarised point where we want to try and think about, again, I think those, those three things around what's the environment look like is, is absolutely key. What's the practice you're trying to do, whether it's a phase of play on 11 v 11 or the, the work we saw with, with it today with the, the quick, quick feet movement. And how's the coach going to think about intervening with the players and interactions? You know, I think we're, we're, we need to be increasingly um, clear and consistent with what that is with the coach educators to drop that message down to the coaches that then will impact that on the players. We, we, we can actually put that into a really sort of uh, clear strap line. Coach the player, in the practice, in the environment, which is the youth awards, but it doesn't uh, that doesn't actually mean that uh, youth awards. It means that any qualification you're in or around, it's about coaching the player in the right practice, in the right environment. Anything else? 